hello, my name is Christine Reiner. I am the communications coordinator with the SD Specialty Producers Association. Um, thank you for joining me today, Bobby Joe from Nom Nom Gardens. Um, we're here to chat about aquaponics um, and, you know, free range chickens and, and more of your special interests. This segment is funded by a partnership with the Natural Resources Conservation Center, our service, sorry, NRCS. Um, it's Monday. I'm I'm slowly letting the coffee get to me. Um, it's been funded by NRCS and the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association to promote sustainable agriculture practices and environmental solutions. Um, so, Bobby Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to hear um, about your farm and just how Nom Nom became what it is today. I am so excited to be here, Christine. Thank you so much for asking for me to present. Um, yeah, I'm Bobby Joe. I own Nom Nom Gardens, which is the name that kind of takes people off guard sometimes. I'm a five-year-old and I call food noms. So that's why we named our farm Nom Nom Gardens. We produce food in uh, various ways. We have free range chickens. Like Christine said, I have bees. We have an in-ground traditional garden. So we use soil practices for that in growing season. And we have a geothermal greenhouse that we grow food from year round. And in that greenhouse, we have aquaponics. And that's what we'll be talking about today is the greenhouse and the aquaponics system within it. And I'm so excited to share. Oh, we also run an event venue for the farm. So um, sometimes we're busy all the time. Just kidding. We're always busy. <laughs> I'm so excited to be able to present. And I am just going to go through a PowerPoint presentation quick and then go over some questions that you sent me. Um, I'm really excited. So this is a picture of our greenhouse and it is, we are between Sioux Falls and Harrisburg. Uh, my husband, Ned, and our little guy, Dean. Um, yeah, that's what that is. Uh, what is our geothermal greenhouse? So our greenhouse is built in ground, six feet below ground level, and utilizes geothermal energy to heat it and maintain an environment that allows us to grow produce year round. Uh, we purchased our greenhouse kit from Russ Finch, who is this lovely gentleman next to my husband down there with the citrus trees. And Russ designed this greenhouse with some engineers at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And he was working as a, post, like a postman for a while and he wanted to grow food in Alliance, Nebraska. And so they had developed this greenhouse and this picture of Ned and Russ was taken in March. So in the middle of winter, there was like six feet of snow on the ground. And you can see Ned holding these huge lemons. And so the system that Russ design is designed to be able to grow food year round sustainably using geothermal energy, which is a very cool system. Um, and so what is geothermal energy? That's the biggest question we get. Uh, it's energy that uses heat that's generated within the earth. So we have big drain tiles, which I didn't know what drain tile was until I saw it. It's big tubes. They're big black tubes that we have bundles of them and they are buried underneath the greenhouse and around the greenhouse. And we use a system of fans that force air through the tubes and they get heated up by the ground's heat, like the heat within the earth. And then it gets rotated back into the greenhouse to maintain a constant air temperature in there. And that fluctuates depending on the weather outside. And the same system helps cool down the, like the greenhouse if it's too hot. We even use that type of system in our house when our house was built. It was built using geothermal greenhouse, or not greenhouse, sorry, sorry geothermal energy. Um, and the greenhouse itself, if you can see these panels, that panel right there, that is a polycarbonate material that we call Lexan, they're panels. And these metal bars, can you see my cursor okay, Christine? Yeah. Metal yeah. bars. So uh, Russet works with a manufacturing company out of Alliance, Nebraska. I believe it's an Alliance. And they manufacture these kits. So uh, the way he designed it is the same for every greenhouse that you buy from him. You get these kits. So you get these metal bars and you buy the locks and panels separately and all the other material. We There's metal paneling on the north side. And we have wooden posts and wooden um, planks that have our um, 
north side grow bed like up against the wall. So it's just a northern wall for that. Um, and within our greenhouse, we use aquaponics. I love aquaponics. We've had different systems of aquaponics in the past for the prob last probably 10 years, we've used different systems. And aquaponics is a soilless system that utilizes aquaculture to grow plants. You can grow everything that's pretty much anything in aquaponics, as long as it's not a plant that hates having its roots wet. So we have, it, it utilizes fish. There's a difference between aquaponics and hydroponics. A lot of folks know more about hydroponics, which is just like those fun grow towers and they use water and you put nutrients in it. With aquaponics, you have fish in a tank that poop in the water, which sounds really gross, but it, their poop just fertilizes things like manure would in the soil. And that water is used to fertilize and water the plants. The plant's roots filter the water and that water gets pumped back into the fish tank. So it's this really amazing system that is sustainable in terms of water use. You're not using soil. We use a different kind of grow medium. And so we don't have to use soil for this at all. And it's sustainable for us because we're not having to add water to it very often. Sometimes the water level will get low because in our greenhouse, it evaporates a little bit, but it's this closed system. It's really easy to maintain once you get the hang of it. Um, and in our system with our greenhouse, we have a, like a trench that runs the length of or a trough that runs the length of our trench in our greenhouse where our plants float on the water that comes from the fish tank. And the water is always in the trough and it's just always running and it's pretty cool. Um, we raise bluegill. I don't know why. My husband, I just think likes the flavor of them. We haven't fished in there yet, but you can, which is another really added system or an added bonus to the system is it's another food source. Some people raise tilapia and shrimp in theirs. There's a Minnesota that has shrimp in their system, which is pretty cool to have something like that in Minnesota. And like I said, we have bluegill. So there's a few hundred bluegill in this system. Their poopy water, they stay in their tank. Their poopy water gets pumped into the, the system and the water stays where it's at. Um, on top of the water trough, we have styrofoam troughs or like rafts, sorry, my Monday, like you said, <laughs> we have styrofoam rafts that we've drilled holes in and have it painted white just to keep it protected from the sun and algae and that, that naturally grow in water. And within that hole, we put our plants. The plants are planted in a net pot, which is a little black um, pot and it has slits in it. So it's like holy. And our grow medium, we use a combination of coconut fiber and vermiculite. And vermiculite is a toxic material. Uh, in some situations, this is a food grade vermiculite and we mix it in a way that is not toxic to us or the food. And we use safe practices when mixing them. Uh, so in this slide, if you see here where my pointer is, this is where our fish tank is at. This is the east side of our greenhouse. And you can see this little black tube. That's where the water runs back into the fish tank from the trough, which is right to the right of that big tank. Here, the second picture, that's a strawberry plant that we grow in our aquaponics system. You can see the roots coming down. They're such healthy roots. They are so happy in the system and that's where the holes come and they float on top. The third picture is of Ned holding up one of the rafts. And you can see all of the roots coming down from there. It's so cool how efficient it is with these plants because they are constantly getting nutrients and we are not dependent, it's not dependent on weather or um, storms. If it's protected, we've had outside systems that if there's hail or whatever else, it gets affected. But these plants are growing constant, constant nutrients as long as you are maintaining the system well enough. And the fourth picture, you can see some baby lettuce plants growing in these troughs, thousands of heads of lettuce at the same time. Um, so it's a really fun system that it, you have to do certain maintenance with it, but I'll get to that at the end with your questions. Um, so specifically in our greenhouse, what do we grow? Uh, we have, as I said, lettuce. Our growing season for a lot of those plants is winter time. 
lettuce can grow really well in cold weather. It can grow okay in heat, but it will bolt faster and get more bitter. So our really great growing season is and we can close the gap of fresh produce that is locally produced then. And we grow strawberries in it. Right now I have onions, beets, lettuce, strawberries, herbs. We've had tomatoes and I have flowers that have gone in there. You can see the second picture. Another thing I grow in a greenhouse is seedlings. Because my growing season is year round, I'm able to start seedlings earlier in the season and I grow thousands of them that I sell to local gardeners and farmers. And it's really fun. It's probably my favorite thing to do is seeing our seedlings growing in other people's gardens. I love it so much. Um, third picture is one of our citrus trees that I took in January of last year. So you can see the snow on the Lexan panels. And it's really weird to be able to go in and grab a lemon in our greenhouse with snow on my boots. It's so cool. <laughs> and the fourth picture is my son Dean grabbing a strawberry from our aquaponics system. Um, and here are some flowers we've had growing. I love the snow picture with the dandelions in the middle because we have dandelions that grow in there. And that was from December of this year, two days after Christmas. So that was kind of fun. And the first picture is a calla lily. And it's kind of fun growing flowers in there um, because you just put the bulbs on top of the net pots and they just grow and do their thing. And it's a lot of fun. In the trough of my greenhouse, I grow flowers that in that environment are perennials all the time. So I can get this bouquet of flowers any time of year if this type, if the if flower is one that will reflower in its native environment, the climate within the greenhouse allows me to grow things perennially that we would have to have as annuals here. I have tomato plants in there that are four years old that continue producing fruit after we cut them back. They just keep growing and they, they take over everything. It's very cool. Um, so the PowerPoint presentation was really short. Um, but I have lots of pictures that we can go through also. Um, I think it was great. It was, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, I'm a very visual person. And so, um, you know, I've, I've luckily been out to your greenhouse and I, yeah. I've got to walk through it. So I, I got to picture it, but for somebody who is, who's like, well, geothermal, what are we doing here? You know, that was very informative and helpful. And, and I think just the fact that it's such a unique greenhouse where you essentially control your own growing season. Yeah. Um, I I think it was a great presentation. So thank you. Don't hate and on I, your PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's short and simple. And I've got so many pictures that it's hard to choose, but it kind of gives the gist of what's going on. Um, one of the main questions we get is, you know, the geothermal and like how big our system is. So um, the greenhouse size that the kit that we bought is 17 feet wide, by 96 feet long. And you can get them longer from them also, but that's the size of our greenhouse and how does the geothermal work? And I kind of went through that. And this is what it looked like after we first completed it. So I'm looking down into the trench and where the troughs sit right here, that's ground level outside. So then it's four feet down or six feet, sorry, six feet down to the ground. There's tubes under here. You can see a tiny little fan down there and a fan up here. There's two more sets of that in other parts of the greenhouse that push that water or push the air through, pardon me. And you this said your entrance. house is on the same system, right? Yeah, so they were built at separate times. When we bought our house, it had geothermal energy. And so it's really nice because our heating bills then are very low. And then we we're connected to propane being out in the country. So our house is heated using geothermal energy and it's more sustainable then. People are saving money. We save money then heating our home and cooling it in the summer, uh, depending on propane, like propane prices is a lot more efficient. Um, and so that's what we did here, making the system more sustainable, right? Now, electrical wires that run to it and connect to our electrical grid. At some point, we will have that off-grid. Always come in steps <laughs> we'll get to that and like the challenges of building any growing system. But at some point, we will have solar panels and hopefully a mill to generate energy out here for it. 
and get it completely off grid. Um, it and takes you can time. See where the it takes time. It does. A, a big chunk of money. <laughs> oh my gosh, the money and the time and wanting things done so quickly is very hard for my husband and I. Like we just wanted to start producing right away. Um, so this is before we got everything done, and we did this ourselves with some help from friends building it. It's actually our second greenhouse in this location because the first one we built six years ago, we didn't have completely finished and a spring storm came and we all know that those spring storms are wicked with the wind and we didn't have it all completed and it just blew apart. So we had to tear it all down and start a year later. And so this is our completed greenhouse now before we really got everything finished. You can see here on the sides that there's spray foam insulation. People who build these greenhouses choose their own types of insulation. We chose spray foam because it was cheaper for us and we did have to pay to have that done. So it just makes sense to do that. And then the energy is more efficient that way. You can see the little tubes down here. That's what drain tile looks like. When I hear drain tile, I think tiles. It's not a tile. It's a tube. I don't know why I call it drain tube. That would be much better for my brain. Um, I think that is good for the inside of the greenhouse. This is what it looks like from the outside. You can see that weird material on the outside here. That is a shade cloth that greenhouse users will put on their greenhouses just to keep it cooler inside. In the summertime, it can get really, really, really hot in there, obviously. So we have that on there to keep it a little bit cooler and maintain that temperature a little bit better. Um, there's a picture of some chickens because they live here. <laughs> I think that's good for pictures then. Um, flowers, what it looks like when we grow our seedlings. Um, I just put these shelves in the middle of the greenhouse and fill them up with seedlings and start selling them um, as soon as it gets nice enough to do so. I get really worried about my babies, my green, my, my plant babies and don't let them leave the greenhouse until it's warm enough to do that. And spring in South Dakota is really difficult, as we all know, if you're a producer in any way or a gardener, because spring can be really unpredictable. And so being able to grow our seedlings here and keep them until it's warm enough is a really big motivator for me to continue doing that. And um, I love it. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. And it's it's incredible how you have so many different parts of of innovative sustainability in you know your process. Um, one thing that you said that I was really surprised about is that you can actually um, eat your bluegill. Yeah. I never thought about that part of the aquaponics. I just was like, oh, okay, the fish stay in there, but that you know, when you need that protein. <laughs> It's a big thing. And so aquaponics, the whole history of aquaponics really goes back thousands of years. And you can go to places in Asia that have used aquaponics systems in their rice fields for many, many generations where they have figured out that the nutrients from that water was helping their, their, with their plants. So they would flood their plant fields. And we have systems like that in Teotihuacan, so in Mexico, the Aztecs would build floating islands to build their, like have their food systems. I have a presentation on that that's completely separate. It's fascinating seeing that, that they built whole islands on water just to grow their food because of the benefits of the water. And then you're not worrying about the depletion of nutrients in the soil because our soil depletion, our soil nutrient depletion is a very real problem. We don't have an endless supply of nutrients in the soil. It's a living organism. And if you're not adding nutrients to the soil, you're not going to have a healthy plant system. We have to have that ecosystem going. And our traditional farming practices from in, um, what we see today as traditional farming practices where you're tilling up the soil, planting things, a monocrop, and then keeping going, that's not healthy for the soil and they're not going to get as many healthy plants and we have run into a very unsustainable farming system from that so aquaponics is a way to grow food sustainably and have that added food source of fish so a meat source that is you know raised sustainably more it's not um, adding to the problem so to speak and there's not the risk of uh, fecal born 
bacteria that you would with other animals then. So when you have manure, you have to make sure that if you're composting it or getting it from someplace that it's aged. With fish, we don't have that problem. We're not getting things like E. coli and other things like that from them. Um, and it's just a really great way to have a system and you can have them as small as you want. In our kitchen, we have a 55 gallon fish tank with goldfish in it and we have aquaponics towers that we use to grow different foods in our kitchen even. So it can be a very large scale. It can be a small scale. There are greenhouses that are, of, you know, thousand foot um, growing footprint or whatever and growing food that for thousands of people at a time. And so aquaponics can be a really efficient system for to grow food. And the biggest maintenance, uh, one of your questions, I'll try to go through those is like, what do you do to maintain it? With, you do have to have the nutrients correct on it. So we have to have a certain amount of fish depending on the system, um, the size of the system. So for our aquaponic system inside, I just, to have the system going, I might have to have a few hundred tiny fish or like a hundred goldfish to get enough poop in the water to have the right nitrates, nitrites and pH level in there. So you want to make sure that you don't have chlorine and other things in there. And there are test strips that you put in your water to test those things. And all of that is maintained by having the right amount of plants and fish in the system. So once you get that system um, working together, it maintains itself. As long as I'm not letting all of my plants in the aquaponic system die, that would be releasing those nitrates and stuff into the water that would kill fish. Everything is good. So it's not maintainless. A lot of folks see a lot of these growing systems that are promoted as this is perfect. It's great. It does take time. So I spend about an hour a day making sure that everything is working correctly, watering the plants within the greenhouse with the aquaponics system, I just have to test those things weekly. And if there's any issues, then we can, you know, like add more fish or take away something, or if we have to, there are nutrients that we can add into the water, but we can't add a lot of things into an aquaponics system because it could kill the fish. So I cannot call it organic. We say no, like chemical, no harsh chemical system is what we would call it. And within the greenhouse, I can't use a lot of things for pesticides or herbicides to make sure it's not getting into or kill the fish. To feed the fish, we just use regular goldfish food. They're not picky. Um, I have greenhouse, like I have grasshoppers in there right now. So sometimes I'll just throw grasshoppers into the tank to watch them just. Uh, grasshoppers are just like everybody's problem right now. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so one of the wonderful questions you sent me was maintenance of the aquaponics. And I covered that. And we do use an electrical system to run the pipes for that. Um, the electricity bill is pretty low on that because it's easily maintained and really self-sufficient. And for pests within a greenhouse, there's no system that is completely maintenance-free, pest-free, or weed-free. I wish I could say that, but a lot of folks would go into wanting to buy a greenhouse thinking that they're never going to have to weed again or have pests I have yet to find somebody that has no issues within there. So we have things like bindweed on the bottom of our greenhouse trench floor. And it's, some people call it like creeping Jenny and things like that. And dandelions are technically a noxious weed in South Dakota. They're, they're naturalized, but they're not native to South Dakota. They're not native to North America. They are naturalized here though. And so we have grand, like dandelions in there and my son loves blowing wishes from them. So they just go everywhere. Um, thankfully we could eat them, but it's just not very beneficial in there. So we do have to maintain that and to do that. We can't spray anything in there. So we just pull those things. It's nice for us in that system because our soil is so heavily, um, impacted with clay. We don't have a really great soil in South Dakota. And when we're digging six feet down into the ground, we hit like clay, and so I was kind of excited that we had weeds in there because native weeds have a really great root system that add nutrients to the soil, like thistles. Nobody, as a master gardener, uh, we have to be really careful about making sure that people don't think they should have thistles in their garden, but it's actually very beneficial to the soil. Um, and the root system is really good at creating a soil system that will allow plants to grow in there. 
So I have my citrus trees growing in the ground in the trunch because I've built up the soil in there using different plants. And um, I'll take the compost, uh, sorry, the soil less medium from our net pots when we are our plants and just dump it on the trench floor. And we have this great soil in there now that we grow plants in. And like I said about the grand, the grease, the blah, restarting uh the, <laughs> the grasshoppers <laughs> yes but the grasshoppers is we're gonna have pests get in sometimes and they multiply like crazy. we use um an industrial grade garlic spray for the grasshoppers it sounds it smells like a pizza shop in there so it's fabulous after we use it um Hard day of working and you walk in and you're like mm, garlic and it just smells so good and we have oregano growing in there year round so it just smells delicious there's and I'll let chickens run in there sometimes to like eat the grasshoppers and if we we've had issues with aphids and I don't know a grower that doesn't if you don't have an insect eating your food you probably shouldn't eat either there's a place and a time and a need for pesticides and herbicides but in our system, we can't have those things because it would kill our aquaponics system. So for us, we had aphids. And to combat that, we released beneficial insects like ladybugs into our, into our greenhouse. And then they just kind of naturally die and they kill the aphids. So that's kind of a fun little system of using nature against itself. Yeah. And we had um, praying mantises in there for a while. And my main thing was wanting to like fight with them, their little arms in the front, but I never, I never got to do that. Wow. That's just, it's so mind blowing that your growing season is completely off kilter from everybody else's. So, you know, when you're dealing with these problems, do you have a certain way you organize what you're going to grow and when you're going to grow it? Yeah. Um, I love that question because our growing season is really winter time for the greenhouse. I said, like I said about the tomato plants, we planted the say the, the tomatoes we have growing in there now, I just rotated out and I have two plants in there that have been growing there for four years. So some things grow year round really well, like the tomatoes and I have cucumbers in there and the citrus trees and they go through their cycle, but they continue producing. For the aquaponics system, because we can grow thousands of things in there, we grow lettuce in the winter time and that is something that is needed in South Dakota in our area being so cold, we don't have producers here being able to do that outside. So greenhouse systems are able to extend or greenhouse producers are able to extend their growing season using greenhouses or with us, we just continue it. So I have seeded um, 800 lettuce plants just this past weekend that will grow very quickly and go into the aquaponic system. And with that continuous nutrient um, supply, they grow really quickly. They grow even qu more quickly than they would in the soil. And so winter is really my jam for growing. Um, I grow things outside in my garden, but it's more of a food forest out there of perennial native bushes, shrubs, and fruit trees and other herbs. And inside the greenhouse, I can grow herbs and lettuce and other things like that year round and kind of close that gap from other producers not being able to sell to their consumers and I sell directly to consumers um, so you're not anywhere local it's just message Bobby Joe you'll get yes. your lettuce in the winter yeah. Yeah. you know that sunshine <laughs> exactly and it's so nice to be able to do that and we do have we're zone commercial so we can have a farmer's market here and we will get that going we'll have one big event hopefully this fall but everybody's busy and there's so many markets so it's just been more beneficial for, beneficial for me to sell directly to consumers, come to the farm certain set times during the weekends that I have that people can come pick up their goodies and then just relax in the hot greenhouse. I've had people just come and sit with their little head of lettuce and like little bunnies just sit and get the warmth because of how cold it gets in South Dakota. And even during our polar vortex a couple of years ago, where it was like negative 40 degrees wind chill, it was still 35 degrees in the greenhouse. And so it doesn't get cold enough in there to kill anything. Our thing is making sure it doesn't get too hot because mm -hmm. that has happened. We were out of town and we came back to everything in our aquaponics system dead. Two days, no, a day before my master gardeners tour here where we had hundreds of people come through. Um, what happened is we had a power outage and our system was offline. So we didn't get the notification that we had a power outage. 
And so the fans that pump the air through weren't able to pump the cool air also. And the more uh, fragile plants like the lettuce died from the heat, but everything else was like, yeah, it's hot. We're going to grow like crazy as we came home to tons of citrus. Um, how did um how did that affect the fish? Were the fish kind of fried? They were physically they were okay. Nutrients wise, we had to add some nutrients to it. So there's just bottles of nitrate and, and things like that that you can add to it. I don't exactly remember what we had to add to it. Um and then quickly put plants in there that would grow roots very quickly. Um but thankfully the fish did not die. <laughs> Their tank is deep enough that they were able to just swim to the bottom and it's covered up by a black tarp. So it's not getting too hot in the tank. Um, yeah, we were afraid that we would come home to a fish apocalypse and everything just dead. Uh, it was pretty intense, but we got it cleaned up and got it going again and it's great. That is, you know, you, you've been through so much with it. This is your <laughs> second build. Yes. Um, and with every growing system, like you said, it's, it's a process. You can't just jump into it overnight. I mean, you have to do the analytics and the data and the research and figure out what really works for you. And, and I'm assuming, you know, different plants are different bases and you have to mix different things for different plants so that the fish stay happy. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a whole different mindset from, you know, going out into the garden, putting down your compost on your soil um, and doing it that way. Um, but can you kind of explain how your chickens play more into it? Um, I, I love the fact that they're free range. They just kind of do whatever they want, right? <laughs> yes. Um, our chickens, we have about 120 of them and they live in a big hog barn, an old hog barn that has a solar door that allows them to go in and out every day. And I have feeders for them that they have fresh food and fresh water um, each day that I just fill up when it needs to so we can leave. And they help outside, they help maintain pests. So they eat things like ticks and grasshoppers. And I let them in my garden because they'll eat those pests and um, I use their, their poop in our compost pile and we age it for two years and then we use that on our soil and it's just incredible, um, very nutrient rich then, and then be able to sell their eggs and have those nutritious eggs being eaten by people is so amazing to me. Uh, we do supplement their food with feed. Um, I don't grow it all the time. I'll grow small batches of food from them, but there's just too many for me to do that. So <laughs> we just have a big hopper that we full, full, full of food and let them do their thing and they're fun. And then the greenhouse, they can't go in there because of the risk of um, their poop contaminating things. So I said, like, I'll let them in there every once in a while. I'll let like one or two in there and they just chase the little grasshoppers and then they go out. And so Watching if they happen to poop in there, the right. <laughs> it's so funny. Like seeing chickens chasing critters around the farm is the cutest thing ever. I didn't know anything about chickens uh, before I got them. So I did not know that they are omnivores. So um, um, if you ever see something that says vegetarian fed chicken, that's not their normal diet. They are omnivores and they are vicious. I've seen them eat mice and frogs. They will eat anything and everything. They are tiny little dinosaurs and they are cute. <laughs> watching them run around and insects are there like they love insects so they will eat all of the grasshoppers and I let them into our garden so I don't have to spray pesticides in our garden or herbicides um the herbicides are more of a weed thing obviously but for the pesticides I don't have to spray that because I let the chickens in there and we have ducks and they don't care about the plants as long as they have critters to eat so it's a really uh, regenerative agricultural system that we use in our farm. We don't water our plants. It's been a drought year. So I don't like, I have a pumpkin patch, but my plants are not thriving because we haven't watered them. We have an underground break in our water system. So I can't just leave a water, our water to outside on. Otherwise I would be hundreds of dollars of wasted water. We don't know where the break is at. And that's part of being a producer in South Dakota. It's part of being a producer anywhere. We live in a place that is not great for soil nutrients all the time and you have to water your things. So I focus on plants that are native to South Dakota or able to withstand drought or heavy rain. 
And that includes things like tomatoes and peppers, but there is obviously caveats to that. If we get a storm or if it's too wet or too dry, they could die. But for the first week, I'll water them a few times when they get outside and then we leave them alone. And I haven't watered them since. They went into the ground and we have hundreds of tomato plants, hundreds of peppers in our garden, and we get hundreds of pounds of fruit from them. And it's only because those are able to survive here. And I grow okra and artichoke, squash and things like that, corn. Um, but it's it's more time consuming if you have more of the more delicate plants. And like beans and peas are really great to grow here also. Um, more water intensive things like watermelon, we don't have here because I don't have the ability to water those things. <laughs> um, that's That's still a long list of, of different yeah that you can cultivate on your own property that's sufficient and just sustainable in its own way are you able to um you know sorry I got distracted by watermelon I know <laughs> I had a quick question <laughs> and I was like I was trying to envision watermelon growing in an aquaponic system because that wouldn't work um it can oh, be half grown. I'm sorry, in things. your system. It would right. Yes. Um, those things can grow. You just have to trellis them. Yeah, vertical. Have yep. you practiced vertical farming at all yes. in your greenhouse? Yep. So we have planted tomatoes and peppers in our aquaponic system. We've had squash in there. The biggest downfall for that is making sure they have enough room to grow and that they don't get so heavy that they weigh down the trough enough where it would flood the top. So we have a trellis system that they would grow on that would keep the weight of the plant off of the trough system. So we've had tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, I had spaghetti squash in there a few years ago. And it's just really a fun way you can grow like I said pretty much anything in an aquaponic system as long as its roots are okay of being wet there's some herbs that are just too finicky they don't like to get their feet wet so to speak and like more drought tolerant things so experimenting with that stuff is a lot of fun and I've got onions like onion bulbs and beets in there right now that just as they grow, we pull them up so the bulbs can grow on top of the soil versus underground, get wood outside. So they just grow on top. And it's pretty fun that way. Wild. And things That's like squash cool. and watermelon thrive in those systems as long as you can have them trellised. So I've yeah. seen systems where like this, the trough area where the water would be and the plants are planted in there. And then they have a cattle panel across it where the plants grow up. So all of that weight sustained on those trellis systems without having to weigh the trough down the big 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 thing there is making sure that the roots have enough room to grow because they grow huge they're just happy and they will do what they need to do um you can trim roots in those systems but you would be risking adding bacterias and things like that um which is it's not a huge issue but it's just kind of nice to let the roots do their thing. So just making sure that there's not too many plants in a system. We use a growing method called square foot gardening. You don't have to have things. It, there's very there's various ways to grow all types of food. There's no right or wrong way. So square foot gardening is letting plants grow closer together to share nutrients in the soil. It helps with water retention. You can do the same thing in aquaponics, which we use for our, our lettuce. You can see in one of the pictures that there were heads of lettuce like back to back to back. With things like squash or tomatoes, you'd have to have them more spread out so their roots are not um, like growing into each other and then restricting the water flow underneath them because they need to get the water through the root systems that filter the water to get back into the fish tank. Wow. So you don't want stagnant water, so to speak. It's, it's just a whole different mentality from normal growing and traditional growing. Yeah. Um, do you feel like your time growing has decreased? Absolutely. So I will spend hours in the garden outside making sure that if there are pests like hornworms, it's a really big green caterpillar. It turns into some moth, I think. They're great. They're cool. They're huge, but they will eat your tomato plants um, and things like voles and stuff like that. I'll spend hours maintaining that in the garden, whereas the aquaponics system, I don't have to do any of that. I will maintain it. Like I said, I'll test the water system about once a week. 
and planting the seeds in it. And then once they get, we plant our seeds, we start off in like just regular growing trays that you would with anything else. And then with the same growing medium, we never use soil. You don't want to put soil in an aquaponic system. It would clog the system, it would clog the pipes. And then the fish don't need that kind of nutrients because the growing medium that you're getting from the stores for soil systems has things like um, manure and things in it if it's a good growing medium and our fish don't need that. Um, so the vermiculite and uh, coconut fiber stays within the pot. It doesn't go out into the water. It's granules are big enough where it doesn't move. And there are different growing mediums that you can use for aquaponics. Some people use rock wool or like little tiny rocks um, just rocks themselves. I don't know, just anything porous enough to let the roots go through. So the time spent on that is very little. I am a huge soil snob and some it's hard for me to go out to the soil and like, you suck. Like I'm, I need to do more. Whereas the aquaponic system, it's so much easier and maintenance is so little that it's great. The more mature the plants, that's where the time comes in because you're having to harvest. So I stagger how we plant things. So I don't have 800 lettuce plants ready at the same time because there's no way I'm going to be able to sell 800 lettuce plants. There's not enough salad goodies for that to make sense to anybody unless I were selling to restaurants. Um, so we stagger our planting time and I'll plant a whole bunch of different things at the same time. So things like beets, and herbs and lettuce and kale and those kind of things. Some things would be way too tall. Like kale can get very big. We, I have cabbage that I've grown in there. I started some cabbage. Those just need more room to grow, but they grow really efficiently in there. But I, aquaponics is amazing. I, I just, I, I wonder how you got into this because it's, it seems like you had to do extensive research on, okay, I have to worry about how big this plant is going to get. And yes. I mean, in traditional gardening or farming, like you do have to worry about that, but mm -hmm. uh, I think with your trough too, you're cultivating that soil within the geothermal greenhouse. So you're finding another space to plant um, and your regenerative farming you're you're creating a healthier soil while doing this so I don't I don't want to take up too much more of your time so I've got two more questions yes. um one question would be do you plan on creating another geothermal greenhouse anywhere on your property or in the future yes so we want to build more and it's exciting we are in the Harrisburg school district and um I love teaching kids how to grow their own food and we plan on working with the Harrisburg School District at some point, hopefully to be able to have a greenhouse system here that would be for the kids in our area. There's an amazing farm within Sioux Falls, like Iron Fox Farm. They do outside gardening and do the same thing. Farmers have been doing that across the country for many, many years. And it works so well to teach kids how to grow their food in the neighborhoods. At some point, Harrisburg will go around us and we'll have a school right across the street from us, right across the street. And that's exciting for me because then we could teach and have summer programs for that year round also with a greenhouse and it's which is such a need because yes we'll keep asking how are we going to fix this farm to school issue mm -hmm. um, let's get produce and good healthy food into schools and of course there are several roadblocks to that but one of the biggest issues is farmers the majority of farmers cannot grow in the winter and so exactly. um you know there's not a lot of options to feed kids during school time and of course school's out during the summer <laughs> right and it's really amazing so Russ Finch the gentleman who built this system to begin with he has systems at schools in Nebraska in this town there is a greenhouse next to an elementary school that they are able to feed the kids. That's where the kids are going for their fresh vegetables and fruits in all year round. And the kids then have classes that are teaching them how to grow their own food. And it's such a beautiful thing that we can do. And it's not, the footprint isn't so enormous that it's restrictive. It is restrictive cost-wise. You know, that's a $24,000 system that you have to build. And with everything else, I think it rounds out to be about there. So there's always costs to involved in it and then maintaining it. You have to have people to do that. So it just makes sense to do that with students or a community. And the learning process there is invaluable, teaching our kids how to grow their own food. And it's fun. The kids, not all kids love it, but so many kids love it. And there's so much joy that comes from teaching them how to do that. 
and it's yeah it's it, it's all dependent upon how it's presented um, yes so if you if you make the environment fun and just you know positive of hey this is really good food this is what you get or hey you have to eat your carrots you know there's the difference um but great points my last question is have you received any funding or grants or you know any help with your projects we have not. There's not a lot available in terms of small scale producing, and there's a lot of risk involved in systems like this. You had brought up the amazing point of how did you learn how to do all of this? And it's trial and error, just like growing outside, but people have grown food since the beginning of time. So we know how to grow a tomato. You know, there's tons of ways to grow a tomato. Aquaponics, we got into this because Ned, my husband Ned and I were both gardeners. We had a garden at home. He learned about aquaponics through his uncle, who was one of the engineers who helped design the system with Russ. So he found out about um, aquaponics through that. And he took a training course in color, uh, in California from a couple from Hawaii who grows lettuce for the Costco's in their area in Hawaii. So there's definite training out there for this. And then it's trial and error, mm -hmm. uh, just like outside where we've figured out what we can grow in there. Um, I don't remember what your question was now. Well, so mainly it was about funding. Would you? Oh, yes, funding. So there's not, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> so with that, there's, um, with that, we would, we're seeing more grants available and funding available um, for special, like the Specialty Producers Association, you guys have um, offered grants through different organizations for these kinds of things. And it's just trying to specify exactly what we're doing. So we have a lot of specialty crops. Everything we do in there is a specialty crop. So there are grants available. We just haven't had any yet, mainly because we had a loan through, um, I don't remember now. We had a farm loan that we just recently paid off. And so we weren't eligible to get a grant for that. The difference between conventional farming where they get subsidies from the government and what we're doing is we don't get those things. There is more risk for growing outside. What I'm doing in the greenhouse, the risks are power outages, which are super rare. And we have now that it's happened to us once, we have systems in place, generators set up if that happens. So we don't have things like crop insurance in there because our crops aren't going to fail at a cat catastrophic level and we can maintain it inside in a way that isn't really, um, needed for those things but yes there are more grants available we just haven't had any yet i um we just like to share you know what resources there are for producers yes. and um you know just the way that the world is going there's more funding opportunity every year and you know the new year is technically starting for 2024 so maybe we'll see some more funding in that area or opportunities for special yes. producers like you because that is a real struggle that um people have to deal with now um bobby joe if you're open to it we did have one question um on our yes. Facebook right and um, so this is from Northern Plains Sustainable Agriculture Society, and they were wondering, can an aquaponics farm be certified as organic in any form? I have yet to see that happen. I don't think so. I think that there have been some, but you have to have the soil base for that to be certified organic. It is a soil based thing with my understanding of uh, being organic. We were going to certify our outside parting, the, where we produce outside organic but we have, we're sandwiched between traditional farm fields. So they're spraying there and we will have the sprayer plants come over sometimes and drop stuff on our soil. So it's, we're not certified organic, but we are not a soil system. So certifying organic in an aquaponic system would be a completely different setup than outside. That's two different categories completely. So what we look at is organic farming outside where you have to have organic practices without using certain types of chemicals and things like that within the soil for a certain amount of years that doesn't pertain to aquaponics. So I can't legally say that we are organic. We use organic practices where we're not spraying or using herbicides or pesticides within the system. Um, so it's two different things and I have yet to see an aquaponic system be or organic in its own category just because we just don't use those things and we can't. So I can't legally say it's organic, but we use organic practices. <laughs> so someday I think there will be, and if there is, I would love to know. And that might be a thing now, but those being two separate categories of being organic farming practices, um, there is a category for it, but yeah, they, if that makes sense. 
for folks. Ever changing, that. just like it's so more funding it, is it coming is. in, more research yes. being done, more <laughs> yeah. things are being cataloged. We'll see this growth, and and I I feel you know like the future is bright. <laughs> it is, and it's so exciting. And that's a question we get a lot, and I love that question. And coming from that organization, if folks don't know, go check them out. They're amazing. And for organic farming practices, it can be so tricky and it can be so expensive for producers to do that to begin with, that it's not always beneficial for us. We use organic farming practices outside too for our soil. Um, so it just makes sense for us. And I was always, oh, I was so excited. Like, oh, we have an organic greenhouse in my my husband's like, Shut up. you can't do that. You can't say that. There's not a thing in there. So we use organic farming practices in there. Um, but I think that there is a category that's completely separate than the outside stuff, which is very cool. As a soil snob myself, it's really hard for me to go in there and be like, huh, look at this soil system in here. With it's with, you know, there's things that are hard about it, but it's so much easier. I don't have to worry about hailstorms and things like that. And <laughs> that's my case. It's it's like a magical little place. And um, you mentioned earlier that you do events. Will you ever host, you know, like maybe a farm to table experience or dinners inside your greenhouse? Absolutely. I love doing that stuff out here so much. And we've done tours in the past through DRA, like Total Action, Master Gardeners Association, um, part of the Minnehaha group there. I like doing individual ones. It's just so time consuming that I cannot wait to just get a big group together. I love doing that stuff. Um, it's it's a lot of fun and the farm to table stuff is, I, I love it. We haven't done a farm to table here other than weddings that have used some of our produce in their stuff. Um, so I them do it themselves, but I love that stuff and I want to definitely do that. Christine, you and I should talk about that. <laughs> Be a good thing uh, to partner yeah. with. That would be great. Let's uh let's work on it. Um, because I think that consumers and other producers would be overwhelmed with just how beautiful your place is. It's really yes. um it's like stepping into a different world. And so I can only imagine it in the snow. That's why I'm like, oh, I'm so jealous. So maybe I'll trek out there. <laughs> yes, I would love to do a tour in the wintertime because that's where it really shines. Um, one question that you had sent me was other systems also, and the system is amazing. It's great. There are other greenhouses that you can produce food in year round in the Midwest. Uh, check out Wayward Farms. I think they're called, um, his name is Shannon and he has a by Brookings. Oh yeah. we um, um... Wayward Springs, Wayward Springs. So he has a greenhouse that he produces out of year round. He sells trees. His stuff is so cool. It's amazing. The footprint is a little bit different. Um, so check out them. I think you guys did a special with him once, didn't you? Yes. Uh, Shannon was a speaker at our um, Upper Midwest Urban and Rural Agriculture Convention yes. past year in 2023. Um, and so we're planning for 2024, but um, we had several really great presentations and those are all on our YouTube. So if anybody yeah. is looking to try to find those, yeah, um, I'll drop the YouTube link and then I'll try to share the um, the greenhouse link that um, Bobby Joe, you shared in the beginning, um, because they're it's just, it's a different way to solve our problems and our food deserts and work together. And so I'm excited for your market. I, um, I can't wait to visit it in person. I want that to be a reality. So uh, best wishes I'm, to you. Thank you. My goal there is to have a space because I'm zone commercial and I like a beer and wine license. We can do events out here. It's just a space where other producers can come whenever they have stuff to sell. Um, we have so many amazing markets from Sioux Falls that are incredible. So it's kind of nice to do that. We are I'm very that fortunate, space. right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Bobby Joe, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And we appreciate your time and knowledge on the subject of aquaponics and what that means compared to traditional soil planting. Um, you've covered a wide range of questions that I'm sure people have. So if anybody wants to contact Bobby Jo, we do have her information in our title description. And of course you can always reach out to our page or uh, message us if you need to get in contact with her. Um, again, this segment has been funded by a partnership with the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association in order to help promote sustainable agriculture and environmental stewardship. 
Um, again, my name is Christine Reiner. I am the communications coordinator for the South Dakota Special Food Producers. And if you are interested in any upcoming events, um, webinars, or anything pertaining to specialty producers in the state of South Dakota, please visit our website at sdspecialtyproducers.org or visit our Facebook page. We've got loads of events coming up. Um, it is state fair um, and the wrap up of summer, which is sad, uh, but very, very excited for fall. <laughs> me too. It's exciting. Um, Thank you so much, Christine, for all you do and for having me on today. Thanks.